Yeah, ready? Council member, um, Kyle is setting up the Facebook Live. So if you can just, he'll, he'll let us know when he gets that set up. I don't want to keep everybody waiting. Okay, so we're recording uh, and we can upload the video to Facebook Live. We're ready when you are. Yeah, we're ready. We're ready when you are. It's taking some time. It's, so we can just start. Just all right, all right. I'm ready. I'm count down for 10 seconds since we are doing um, Office of Cable Television. I want to be five, you know. To the whole speaker. Four, three, two. All right. Here we go. So good afternoon. I am Trayon White Sr., a Ward 8 Council Member Chair of the Committee on Recreation and Library Youth Affairs. Today is Wednesday, February the 23rd, 2022. We are meeting remotely in the, on a Zoom platform. The time is now 12 10 p.m. I apologize for starting late. Something is going on with my computer. We try to start as close to on time as possible. I'm calling this meeting to order uh, for this agency performance oversight hearing. Today we have the performance agency oversight hearing for the Office of Cable, Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment. The, the mission of this agency is to produce and broadcast programming for the District of Columbia's public, educational, and government access cable television channels and digital radio stations. Regulate the District of Columbia's cable television services providers, um, provide customer service for cable subscribers, and support and a sustainable film, music, and entertainment creative economy and labor market in the District of Columbia. In the responses from the agencies to the committee, all the FTEs were filled, which is commendable. Additionally, the agency was was able to meet their main priorities in FY 2021 budget of developing the bridge and of, of developing the bridge the equity gap, inclusivity and reliance programs, resilience programming, creative economy, economic recovery legislation, developing Google Music su support and preservation plan, uh, develop a website for the Creative Affairs Office and public introduction of just Columbia Entertainment Channel, also known as DCE. I'm looking forward to hearing the public witnesses today and also our government witnesses. And so with that being said, we want to start off by elevating our public witnesses to the panel. Um, as I call our first group of public witnesses to the panel, you will be promoted. Um, we will have a tight schedule and request that all witnesses are here to there are a lot of time. All public witnesses appealing, appearing on their own behalf will be allowed at three minutes. And those who are a part of a ANC or in an official capacity will have five minutes to testify. And so let's get started. So first I'm gonna call S Stephen Hill. Christina Noel, and the cost of bid. Hey, Delmar Patterson, CCAP, Kevin Vaughn, and if Kevin Vaughn is not available, Monica Ray is here, um, Vice President of Capital Service Management. Okay. Juliet Rose. Make Renee 
T. I'm just going to say T. I don't want to butcher your last name. Yes. Yes, counsel. Tian Go Kiko? Tian Go Kiko? Tian Kiko, yes. Um, should, um, I, I, should, should I start or are there other public witnesses that I don't want to jump my no, you, you, you like you, you probably, it's like four other people in front of you. So it's a little minute. I appreciate your, your willingness to speak before us today. Um, so we're going to start with, I see, hold on. Is Stephen Hill here? I see a Stephen Johnson. We don't see Stephen Hill, sir. Okay. We're going to start with our own um, Christina Noel from Anacostia Bid. Good morning, or good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairperson White and members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs for allowing me to testify today. Um, again, my name is Christina Noel, and I am the Executive Director of the Anacostia Business Improvement District. I'm here to offer support to the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, OCTFME. OCTFME support of the creative economy fuels the development of an innovative workforce and a vibrant economy. This is an engagement that enriches quality of life and improves health and well being. OCT FME is designed to amplify, assist, and inspire creatives locally, nationally, and internationally. Their reach, coupled with their experience in showcasing DC's talent and industry opportunity landscape, has opened the door to DC's creative culture for all to see. This has set the framework for DC as a regional, national, and global creative hub. OCTFME's efforts allow DC to continue to expand as a major competitor in the global entertainment industry, while at the same time, they are a resource for the district's creative re residents and directly improve, I'm sorry, directly provide beneficial services to local creatives such as film production, television programming, and workforce development, just to name a few. They engage, the, they engage the community to create a greater understanding of the creative economy as a whole and provide access to training opportunities required to become marketable creative economy industry professionals. East of, the river for, East of the river for decades faced many challenges such as the lack of food options for, to crime and COVID-19 pandemic, a very different challenge. The small businesses and local community have had to be more creative than before. Their acute survival instincts kicked in. The closing of private offices and government agencies, cancellation of events and lack of opportunities put ward aid businesses and creatives in an unknown bind. The COVID-19 pandemic is unlike any challenge our small businesses and creatives and residential community have had to navigate yet they found ways to survive. Now is our time to be bold and work from a, place of, from a place of survival to thriving. The District of Columbia is a world-class destination and we must be intentional in our efforts in continuation and amplification of our creative economy. In it. The Anacostia bid recognizes that enlisting creatives as, a, as partners in community development is an effective way to build community and encourage economic growth. Now more than ever, it is important to recognize the positive impact that OCT FME has had and will continue to have on the creative economy, workers, and our broader communities in our community and the District of Columbia as a whole. The Anacostia bid supports the efforts of OCTFME. We look forward to their continuing with creative driven projects with the goal of providing access and opportunity for creatives, adding life and vibrancy to DC communities and connecting communities with ours from around the world. Thank you council member, chair person and the committee on recreations, libraries and youth affairs for your tireless efforts and your time. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. I am at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you so much.
now we will have Delmar Patterson. Hey guys, right ahead. can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, my name is Delmar Patterson. Uh, I was a member of the CCAP program last year. Um, as part of the Office of Cable Television here in the district. And I would like to just say that it was an amazing opportunity for me. I recently just graduated college uh, in the fall of 2020. And I was out here looking for a job and I was able to work with one of the local uh, television companies in the district. And through that, I met somebody who told me about how the Office of Cable Television was offering a CCAP program. And I thought that would be an amazing opportunity for me to you know, use my degree in advertising to then go into a career of entertainment and television. And I used that opportunity to take advantage of that and was a part of the CCAP program and was then adopted by DCTV. DCTV is, I don't know if everybody knows, is the public access station here in the district they provide lots of educational and entertainment content around the city. And through that, I was able to upgrade my skills and learn how the business side of the entertainment sector works. And through that internship, which lasted from February to September, I was able to then adopt a full-time position here. And now I am a production specialist and instructor looking to educate other members of the city. And I'd just like to thank the Office of Cable Television for providing this amazing opportunity. Um, anybody has any questions? Um, I apologize, thank you so much. Uh, we'll come back to you. Do we have anyone here from Capital Service Management. Council member, we're trying to promote uh, Monica that. Ray. She just needs to accept the promotion. Okay. Let me just go to the next person and when she comes in, oh, there she is. Monica, are you? Oh, that's Kevin. Okay. Good afternoon, Council Member. How are you? Kevin, you look nothing like Monica. I'm good at yourself. Doing well. So, my name is Kevin Vaughn. I'm actually here on behalf of uh, Monica Ray, who is the Vice President of Capital Services Management. Uh, she has a conflict, but I did want to uh, read her uh, testimony on the record. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman White, Council Members Bonds, Nadeau, Lewis George, and McDuffie. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Uh, I'm a resident of Ward 8, a business owner and community development corporation leader in Congress Heights. As an advocate for sustainable economic development, I am impressed by Mayor Bowser's and the DC Council's support and dedication to, local, to the local creative economy. Now more than ever, it is important to comment on the positive impact that the OCT FME has had and will continue to have on the thousands of creative economy workers in the District of Columbia, and more specifically local CDE firms like Capital Services Management. The OCT FME is designed to assist and inspire creatives locally around the country. And entertainment industry and has set the framework for DC as a regional, national, and global creative hub. Through the OCT FME Film Rebate Fund, filmmakers from around the country are encouraged to use the historic city as the backdrop or setting for their stories. The beautiful scenery of DC can now be seen on silver screens and in theaters around the world. And around
incentivizing the production of these big budget projects in the district provides job opportunities for residents. Mr. Vaughn, I don't hear anything at the moment. I'm not sure if it's my computer or yours. Okay, I guess he's froze. Okay, I can see you now. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now, yep. Uh, having witnessed the hard work that the Office of Cable TV does day in and day out, I think one of the most overlooked byproducts of their work are jobs created through the employment of CDE firms. When we, when we are called upon to support one of the many fantastic events like the Mayor's Arts Awards, Emancipation Day, or 202 Creates, not only is the creative economy impacted, but jobs are created and sustained by small events supported uh, and marketing contracts that flow through CDE firms that ultimately hire local labor. Under the leadership of Director Gates, the office places a strong emphasis on job creation and workforce development. The office sponsors a series of professional training programs through their partnership with the local chapter of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. The development of the Creative Economy Career Access Program and the implementation of the 202 PH Residency Program. These programs level the playing field for DC residents who could otherwise lack access to such learning and professional opportunities. While there are still considerable hurdles for creatives to overcome, OCT FME is certainly alleviating many of the stresses that could hinder the ability for local creatives to achieve success and participate in the economy, while continuing a pipeline of local hires behind the scenes as well. Now more than ever, the services, expertise, and mission of the OCT FME are needed in the District of Columbia. The agency must maintain programs that work to equitably revitalize the economy and see that DC residents are given opportunities to diversify their skill sets and professional qualifications. I thank Mayor Bowser, the DC Council, the Committee on Government Operations, Chairman White, Director Gates, and the entire OCT FME staff for their continued commitment to creative economy workers in DC and CBE firms for their dedication to strengthen the arts and culture sectors of our committees. Respectfully, Monica T. Reck. Thank you. Appreciate that. Renee. T. Thank you. Uh, Chairman White and distinguished members of the committee, it's an honor to offer oral testimony about the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, and the committee's oversight over the agency's performance. Uh, for the sake of this virtual hearing, I will refer to OCTFME as the agency, just to, to shorten it today. My name is Renee Tionkiko, and I am on the board of directors of a nonprofit housing cooperative here in Ward 3. I'm providing oral testimony to the committee and my experience with the agency's services. For the committee's reference, I provided written testimony for the public record. Today, I'll highlight how the agency helped our cooperative get in contact with one of the regulated entities that oversees the cable industry. In March, 2021, our cooperative had some connectivity issues with our cable and internet provider, Comcast Xfinity. In short, the coax cables and other wires that are used by the various units in our building were kept in a box owned by the regulated entity, Comcast. However, birds and other critters were burrowing in Comcast boxes and the chewed wires ended up disrupting cable and internet services to our residents. I contacted uh, the agency to see what they could do to help us. The agency got in contact with Comcast to remind Comcast of their responsibilities. Comcast DC area team got in contact with me to arrange for a resolution. The agency also sent a cable inspector, a DC government employee to our property to inspect Comcast's work. So after contacting the agency, we are really happy to report that Comcast finished the job with the cable boxes. I know this, that had I called Comcast General 800 number, I would have been another number and a customer still waiting in the queue. We wanna 
to give a special thanks to Mabel uh, Gis and Marcella Hicks for being stellar DC government employees. They embody public service for the greater good that should be the model of every DC government employee. Our cooperative was so impressed and honored that we nominated the agency's cable inspection team and consumer response unit. Testified, access to cable and internet is especially important for the most vulnerable as of, uh, for the most vulnerable. Because of the agency's authority and work, DC students can learn from home, seniors can connect with their doctors, and employees can work from home and ensure that Washington remains the vibrant city it is. So as the committee reviews the agency's performance, I can attest as a representative for my housing cooperative that we have a lot of faith in OCTFME. Um, many re DC residents have experienced disruptions to internet or cable services, and it's wonderful to know that a regulatory agency helps hold these cable providers accountable, and the committee should be assured that it has one of the most competent agencies within its purview. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Dr. Jackson, are there any more public witnesses in the queue? No, sir. Hello? No, sir. Okay, great. All right, let's come back up. I want to start with Ms. Noel. Any cost of it? Yes. Um, hey, I think my customer. So, uh, real quick, have you? Uh, yes, have you worked on any particular programs with uh, OCTFME? I actually, um, the Anacostia Bid started a program called Art to Go Go. It's actually a small business initiative, but it focuses on. Um, uh, making sure we have uh, murals within our community uh, that uh, artists we pay to um, put ground murals in our scooter corrals. Plus, we have a QR code that you can scan, and it's near businesses, which, um, as you're on your scooters and bikes, it, it directs you to businesses. Um, OCT FME actually, excuse me, uh, OCT FME, um, as we were working on this project. Um, partnered with us to make sure that we were able to have more uh, artists that were involved, help us to amplify it, help us to shape it as much as we can, as, you know, even more. Um, so yes, and it was an amazing experience and uh, they've brought multiple events to the area that um, we worked um, in, in hand in hand on. So. Um, and as we're becoming an arts and cultural district, um, it's their, their um, help and guidance is, is just really needed. I appreciate that. And I, I have had the opportunity to see uh, some of the artwork with the QR codes has been phenomenal um, in and around Ward 8. Is this expected to expand throughout the city? Because I think there's is pretty innovative. Thank you. Um, we want to really focus. We we definitely would love to do that, but we're you know I'm all about board eight right you know right now and making sure that we have what we need over here. Um, but so that would be my focus at this point. But um, at some point, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Yes, can you? Yeah, I can hear you now. T tell me, um, you talked a little bit about your experience with CCAP. Um, how many uh, people were in this cohort of, uh, I guess, interns with US CPAP? Well, in the CCAP program, there were five people, including me, but we we're each selected to go to like different uh, studios and production houses around the city. 
Um, can you tell me some of the key takeaways you got from the program and or if you can think about anything that we can add on to make it more beneficial and reach a broader audience? Um, I think it's really beneficial getting that hands on experience like in the industry. Like, like I said, this is my first like real job post college. So I got to really know like how the industry works, how a TV station works. And I really appreciate that. So I think one of the best ways to you know expand the program is to just keep providing that real life experience so that people can get that real work experience when you know they go on to even greater things and do, what's your plans on continuing this in this field in the future is this something you want to stick to um i know you were saying this is your first time having that experience what now uh, my biggest goal is to own my own production house. So I want to be able to have people come to me. And we can like produce like music videos or music or movies or short films. And I want to be able to facilitate that and produce it. So I'm hoping that, you know, this experience that I'm learning now will help me make that dream come true. Great, great. Well, I wish you well in your endeavors. Um, and we look forward to, uh, I guess, you know, expanding this program and getting more people. Because I often hear people, um, I, I met someone yesterday and they asked him what I did. I asked him what they did. They said, well, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm like, okay, that's so broad. You know, I'm like, what do you do? And she began to talk about she's into creating content for filming. Um, she's into music, but she felt like DC wasn't at its maximum potential to uh, foster film in this region. And I was like, man, you know, I hear that a lot. And so just hearing um, different people with those career goals, like I think it's, we have a, we are under great leadership um, right now with Ms. Gates to really push that and put the piece to the puzzle to make it uh, what we could be. Um, so I'm excited to hear, from, you know, uh, youth and young adults just talk about their aspirations to um, broaden production of TV and film and music in this region. So thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. I hope that DC becomes the capital of entertainment one day. Thank you. Look forward to it. Mr. Vaughn. Yes, sir, Councilman. Yes, um, with the jobs that the office creates, uh, how do you feel uh, Feel more people can get involved into these job opportunities? I think one of the big things, again, we, we really wanna emphasize our appreciation for OCT FME reaching out to CBE firms, specifically uh, black minority firms. Um, we saw with movements such as Don't Mute DC, um, the importance of really maintaining the cultural history of DC, uh, one, one of those being through Go Go Music. Um, we're located here in Ward 8. Um, we work uh, closely with a lot of residents here. So when we're looking to source talent for a lot of events, um, we kind of start locally here in Ward 8 um, and Ward 7 east of the river uh, to ensure that uh, community residents are able to participate in a lot of these city funded programs. Got you. I appreciate that. I know we are one of many venues for our art or our, our, our night, um, in which the office of cable television. I know I still use the old name, but it's easier. Um, have been extremely supportive, and and as we just heard, we we hear from people all the time as wanting to get into the filming, wanting to get into production, wanting to get into TV, wanting to get into podcasts, different ways to get their messages out. Um, and doing Art All Night, have your organization been in conversation with the Office of Cable Television about a production of any kind or doing anything involving studios? Um, not formally. Um, there have been conversations. Um, as you know, the, the we suffered from the pandemic for the last two years, so a lot of our um, content was virtual. Um, so we're looking forward this year, hopefully, to getting back uh, to some in-person programming, and that's absolutely one to take.
Thank you. And I do know I've been seeing uh, one of the young ladies, uh, Miss Kiana, that works there that has her own uh, arts and culture movement going on, integrated with the work in the, in the art uh, field. So I look forward to the great things coming out of your office and what you are offering, and not just to the world, but to Washington, D.C. with the creatives. Thank you, man. As always, we appreciate your, your work. Uh, today. Thank you. Um, Ryan T, are you still here with us? Yeah. Yes, Chairman. Is it Ryan or Renee? I'm sorry. It's Renee. Sorry, I apologize, Renee T. Got you. Um, how can other agencies in DC be better in customer service the way you feel about this office? You know, because, you know, I guess for me, I hear the good, bad, and the ugly. And you seem to have a great experience. Was it the person? Was it the systems? Was it what 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 was it that made it as great? And what do you think we can do systematically to do this with other agencies? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I think that's an excellent question. Um, the the agency OCTFME they devised a methodical action oriented customer service response. Um, uh, to you know, to connect DC residents with their regular regulated entities in our experience, um, that's not always an easy case for other DC government agencies. So I think um, the agents, their current agencies, um, you know, just customer service oriented um, approach uh, is really what made the difference. As I mentioned during my testimony, if I had just called the regular 800 number, I would have just been still in the line and we wouldn't have gotten our answers um, uh, from, from Comcast. Um, it's very easy to get lost in the pile, but that one-on-one -on -one and that connection with uh, uh, OCTFME made all of the difference. Um, we really want to emphasize that for all Washingtonians during this pandemic, you know, access to cable and internet services, it's a lifeline. You know, these, these DC students need to learn from home, seniors need to connect with their doctors, um, and people to continue their work at home. It's, it's really essential, we, we believe. And we really attribute quite a bit of it to the customer service uh, team at OCTFME and their cable um, uh, inspectors. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you sharing and joining us today. Uh, we're going to move right along to our government witnesses, um, who I see are already in the queue. Give us one second to transition. Good afternoon, Director Gates. Good afternoon, Chairperson White. How are you? Good. I'm good. See, I knew I knew I was going to be having a hearing with you today, so I went and got me some lights. <laughs> look, you are you are studio ready. Yeah, you know, I, tr I look, tried. Look, it's time for your show. You yeah, don't hit this. The, you don't hit the stage. But my technology is not up to par. This computer here is working against me, so. Well, we'll help you with that. We'll, 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 we'll help you with that. We, we have you covered. All right, great. Uh, we represent the District of Columbia. We want to have the best of the best there is to offer our residents a high quality service. We're going to get you Amy ready. How about that? Good. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, um, we want to, we want to elevate all government witnesses to the screen if they are going to be speaking or giving any form of testimony we're going to ask them to join on with the video um so we can do the traditional swearing in thank you for that Um, 
Okay, Mr. Niles, are you able to join us on camera? I believe I've joined. Can you see my, can you see me? Yep, I can see you now. Great. Okay, thank you. It'll be quick. Um, if you can stop raising your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give to the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Everyone else? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Director Gates, you can um, show I give you a testimony. I think you have a video as well. So yes, I mean it is the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, <laughs> and Entertainment. So you know we were going to come with the video. So uh, if it's okay with you, uh, we would love to share our performance highlight reel. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. From the start, 2021 was a year like none other. This afternoon, I announced the citywide curfew for the District of Columbia beginning at 6 p.m. this evening. Yet through all the highs and lows, the district remains strong in the face of unprecedented challenges and show the world how a city moves forward together. And OCTFME was there every step of the way. Our legal and regulatory team worked closely with the district's cable providers to ensure they were delivering on their commitments and COVID-19 protections while supporting their efforts to expand service throughout the district. For our programming team, the year was filled with live mayoral press conferences, media briefings and health and safety updates, with our coverage reaching millions globally on major networks like CNN and MSNBC. And locally, residents turned to DCC to watch hundreds of virtual council hearings. Throughout the year, OCTFME aired over 1,300 hours of programming, earning a variety of awards while collaborating on diverse projects with the Office of Racial Equity, DC Public Schools, and the Metropolitan Police Department. But we didn't stop there. We also launched DCE, the city's first and only global streaming network with the mission of providing an international platform, enabling DC creatives and our programming to be seen around the world. We could also be heard over the airwaves with DC Radio celebrating its fourth year as the District of Columbia's first government radio station and one of only two municipally owned full power radio stations in the country, providing quality, engaging programming, PSAs and promotions heard by residents on 96.3 HD4 and streaming live on dcradio.gov. And whatever you do, don't look up. Our film division is in full swing, supporting big-time Hollywood crews and local independent producers, serving as a one-stop shop, issuing film permits, providing production assistance, and managing the Film Rebate Fund, a program that brings jobs and money to the district. But that's just the beginning. Our Creative Affairs Office is dedicated to preserving, expanding, and uplifting the district's creative community through innovative programs such as Care for Creatives, which provides mental health counseling to artists. CCAP Media, a workforce development program that connects underrepresented communities with training opportunities. Tax rebates for performing arts venues affected by the pandemic. A masterclass series that provides expert advice from top professionals. 202 creates residency program that helps take artists to the next level. And a program that gives funding to promote the rich tradition of go-go music in the district. All of these efforts culminated with 202 Creates Month and the 36th Annual Mayor's Arts Awards at the historic Howard Theater, paying tribute to the artists, performers, and entrepreneurs that make the district the most vibrant city in the world. And we are here for all of it.
I hope everyone enjoyed that video. Is it okay for me to proceed with my testimony, Chairperson White? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson White, members and staff of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries and Youth Affairs. I'm Angie Gates, Director of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment, OCT, FME. On behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser and the agency, I am pleased to provide testimony about the activities and accomplishments of OCTFME in fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022 to date. The mission of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment is to regulate cable television service providers, provide high quality, responsive, customer service for district cable subscribers, produce and broadcast 24 hour public educational and government PEG programming and content highlighting the district's culture, grow and support a sustainable creative economy and entertainment media industry by managing programs and initiatives such as the film rebate fund, 202 Creates, and through activities of the Creative Affairs Office. Mayor Bowser's fiscal year 2021 budget made investments that supported our efforts to deliver on the promise of shared DC values. These efforts include creating economic opportunity, making our neighborhoods safer, and providing more effective and efficient government services. While the coronavirus health pandemic has plagued the world and has crippled our economy, we continue to work each day to fulfill our commitment to provide district residents with opportunities and a pathway to the middle class. OCT FME's legal and regulatory team continue to work closely with the district's three cable and internet service providers during the pandemic to ensure prompt resolution of cable related issues and monitor compliance against service disconnections. The team also continued to facilitate the provider's efforts to upgrade technology and expand services throughout the district. During the COVID-19 pandemic, OCTFME has continued to provide transparency and valuable information to district residents through its three PEG channels, DCN, DCC, and DKN. In FY21, our production crew covered 200 live mayoral press conferences and media events presented by the Executive Office of the Mayor. Additionally, our programming team showcased 322 virtual hearings on DCC with the support of the DC Council. OCTFME remains on the front line as a vital broadcast feed source for television markets reaching millions globally. Clips of our footage continue to air on news media outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Fox, The Today Show, and Good Morning America, just to name a few. In a historic move, OCTFME launched the city's first and only streaming network, DCE, the District of Columbia Entertainment Network in September, 2021. DCE delivers award-winning lifestyle and entertainment programming produced in Washington, DC for a global audience. DCE provides an international viewing opportunity that supports OCTFME's mission to elevate and amplify the creative community. During FY21, OCTFME collaborated with the newly created Office of Racial Equity to produce the Voice of the People series and partnered with DC Public Schools and the Washington Informer to produce an award-winning virtual spelling bee. Our multi Emmy award-winning team worked with a local producer 
to acquire original GoGo music to enhance our video music library. OCTFME continued its collaboration with the Metropolitan Police Department, producing over 25 public service announcements to solicit the public's support in solving unresolved homicides in the district. In total, OCTFME aired over 1,300 hours of diverse programming, earning an Emmy nomination for Best Directing, eight NATOA, National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisor Awards, nine Tele Awards, and a Hometown Video Award. In FY21, OCTFME engaged a certified business enterprise vendor to make technical upgrades to the agency's emergency infrastructure systems. The uninterrupted power supply and HVAC chiller systems were replaced to address proper electrical functions and support press communication for national and international media outlets. Throughout the pandemic, DC Radio continued to produce high quality content. Our programming included audio and video podcast, PSAs and promotions, which aired across our digital and social media platforms. OCTFME's film division is a one-stop shop that issues film permits, provides production location assistance and manages the film rebate fund. The Film Rebate Fund promotes economic impact by creating jobs and providing media training opportunities for district residents. In FY21, film production in DC started to return to pre-COVID levels. The Film Rebate Fund supported six qualifying awardees, including two local production companies. The overall economic impact for the rebate fund projects was $6.7 million. And the projects provided 175 district resident job hires and $796,000 in wages to district residents. OCTFME's Creative Economy Career Access Program, CCAP, is an innovative workforce development program that connects district residents from underrepresented communities with local creative economy training. In FY21, CCAP provided paid on the job training for five district residents. During FY21, 35 individuals graduated from the 202 Creates Residency Program. 202 Creates also conducted 12 virtual masterclass conversations with the district creatives, which promoted entrepreneurship, social awareness, culture, and entertainment. Industry leaders also shared valuable advice on best business practices. As a division of OCTFME, the Creative Affairs Office CAO showcases and preserves the district's rich creative communities throughout all eight wards. CAO builds sustainability in the creative community through policy and programming, which further expands the pathway to the middle class for the creative workforce. In accordance with the GoGo People's Plan, CAO distributed financial support to artists, initiatives, and programs designed to preserve and promote the district's go-go music, history, and culture. The go-go financial allocations promoted the mission of the go-go plan through various partnerships with entities and curated programming within the district. CAO also advanced the Performing Arts Promotion Amendment Act of 2021, PAPA. This legislation establishes real property tax rebates for eligible live performing arts venues affected by public health emergencies. In partnership with the George Washington University, CAO continued 
its Care for Creatives initiative, which provides confidential, pay what you can, mental health counseling to creatives, entrepreneurs, and small business owners. Through this partnership, CAO launched Care for Creatives Community Conversations. This virtual series included 14 conversations that focused on supporting creatives' mental health. CAO held the second installment of the Business Over Brand Program, which improves access to resources for district creatives to build their businesses and grow their brands. The virtual program provided dynamic content featuring 17 speakers from local and national organizations. To close out FY21 and a successful 202 Creates Month, the district's rich arts community shined bright on September 28th at the 36th Annual Mayor's Arts Awards at the historic Howard Theater. The award show was back in person, hosted by comedian Joe Claire. The show aired on DCN and YouTube and honored 14 award categories, including two new categories for excellence in youth creativity and excellence in fashion and beauty industries. OCT FME demonstrates its dedication to district residents, businesses, and the creative community by providing open and transparent communication. We will continue to utilize our various media platforms to promote DC talent and showcase the district as a premier location for media production. In conclusion, I'd like to thank Mayor Muriel Bowser and you Chairperson White for your leadership and support. We appreciate the opportunity to share our accomplishments and future plans and look forward to working with the committee. This concludes my testimony. My staff and I are happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Gates, uh, and thank you for your staff. Um, I guess I wanna start off as we try to expand our uh, access to, to television in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I was wondering what are some of the barriers we run into being though this is some federal land, local land, um, as far as filming. And I hear some pushback from the community about drones and things like that. How are we working through that with our federal partners with permits? Uh, thank you for that question, Chairperson White. Uh, so you are absolutely correct. Uh, the uniqueness about Washington, D.C. is we are a multi-jurisdiction uh, city. So you can have one foot on the sidewalk, and that's federal, and one foot on the street, and that's city. Uh, so what we've tried to do uh, is make it a point uh, to get ahead of it uh, by staying connected to our federal partners, having monthly meetings uh, to make sure that we are communicating, not when there's a problem, but when there's no issue involved just to resolve this matter. Uh, by having this open communication and dialogue, uh, I mentioned in my testimony being a one-stop shop. Our goal is not to take filmmakers and producers and have them just, you know, call this national office or this federal office. We strategically serve as a liaison and it's, it's required open communication. It's required consistent communication and the drone situation, because it's not uh, in our control, we have provided support letters um, when it, drones were needed. Um, and there have been times when they've been amenable, um, but not every time, but there have been times when, when, when the federal have been amenable to it. But what we have found, we just, we have to continue to communicate. Uh, during this pandemic timeframe, we've done a lot of virtual filming. Uh, and so we've had to have that close relationship with having production trucks on the street. Uh, sometimes you're running lines that may cross federal property, uh, but with the open dialogue that has helped. For the public viewing, how can one get access to a permit for doing filming in the District of Columbia? And what constitutes a permit? What is needed to um, I guess it's a threshold to say, oh, you need a permit to do that type of filming or to do this at this particular place. 
uh, thank you for that question. So they should contact our office. As a matter of fact, I have uh, our associate director of the film division uh, on the day as with me today, Herbert Niles. He can walk you through the step-by-step -step process, um, but we've made it affordable. That's just one thing that I would like to add uh, as, as far as the cost of the film permits. So for example, there are a lot of uh, talented students that are shooting films as well. So we don't have a specific uh, permit Fee. We try to accommodate uh, all budgets from a film production perspective. Uh, Mr. Niles, if you'll walk them through our permit process. Thank you, Director, and good afternoon, Chairman. So yes, the Director is correct. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for any student film, all permit fees are waived. And to your question about what are the threshold, what do you need a film permit for, and what do you not, not need a permit for? So our District of Columbia Municipal Permitting Office we permit for any filming activity on District of Columbia municipal open spaces or any District of Columbia managed or owned facility. So if you um, are filming or would like to film or park uh, in front of for the purpose of filming any uh, building or space in that category, you would reach out to our office. You can always email us at film at dc.gov or you can go to our website and go to the film dropdown and select film permitting and all the information you need uh, on the process is there. And we have a great team of permit technicians that are dedicated to making this process as easy as possible. So anyone that's just curious, even if you're not ready to film right now, you're gonna film in the future and you want someone to walk you through the process, our team is happy to walk anyone through that process. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just a little curious. So I know with us having some of the historic uh, monuments uh, and locations here in the district that is talked about around the world, I see a lot of films that, that have those pictures. Um, are those pictures real um, or are they digitized? I know like White House Down movie was digitized, but I know I saw some clippings from House of Cards. Is that really filmed here? And, and is, do they can work in conjunction with your office if they are? That's a great question. And uh, to, to answer it specifically, uh, there's what's called B-roll. And what that is exactly is production companies, and we can use House of Cards as an example, they'll come physically into the city and they will capture a lot of this footage. Now, in the world of entertainment, they, there have been times um, where production companies have uh, created sets at different sound stages and built replicas of DC. But we've made it uh, very important to state there's only one real Washington DC. <laughs> so we promote it very heavily for you to come here, uh, capture B-roll, but really to come here and, and film. Uh, to your point about a lot of historical landmarks, we also have made it a point to create a location gallery here in Washington, D.C. through our office to let various production companies know there's so much more to our city than the historical monuments. There's something to offer in all of the eight wards. Uh, one of the projects actually in Ward 8 uh, shot at the, the, the big chair. Uh, so for us, we want to make sure that uh, everyone in the film industry understands that we have a wonderful landscape across our city that goes beyond those historical landmarks. Got it. Thank you. Um, your testimony discusses how the agency worked with three cable providers to resolve uh, cable related issues. Can you elaborate more on some of the specific types of problems that the agency could assist with? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, sure. So one of the things uh, that was very crucial, especially during the pandemic, and one of the witnesses talked about it, is maintaining service throughout the, the, the pandemic. And with that being said, that was eliminating uh, disconnections from taking place uh, with any of our cable providers. So uh, to the cable providers' credit, they worked very closely with us. They were very supportive. Um, there are, are different times where we've gotten calls about infrastructure 
concerns as well, uh, where someone may not be able to access a particular cable company, or there's just some technical issues. So uh, Mabel Gist and Marcella Hicks mentioned earlier, shout out to them. Uh, they are the best customer service gurus uh, in government um, that we've had to come in and, and manage that discussions with the cable company, either to clean up loose wires or just to access a, a building. Uh, so that is one particular area or thing that's come up. Uh, Counselor, I don't know if there's anything you would like to add, Lawrence Cooper. Yes, uh, thank you, Director Gates and Chairperson White. So during the pandemic with so many people working remotely and students, you know, remote learning, uh, the cable operators who are also internet service providers, their systems were overwhelmed. So another aspect of what we have been doing, um, particularly in, in FY21, is supporting them in their efforts to technologically upgrade their infrastructure. Uh, you know, we get infra infrastructure, you know, uh, inquiries or concerns, whether it's down lines, uh, pole issues, construction issues, but on one side, we are facilitating customer service for the residents. On the other side, we facilitate the ability of the providers to provide the best service they can. And of course, knowing how critical the internet was, there were a lot of technological and buying, uh, improvements that were made, the fiber optic networks, what have you, uh, that had to be enhanced to carry this increased traffic and activity. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, you mentioned in your testimony, Director, um, the agency's compliances against services disconnectors. Uh, what are some of the findings from the agency regarding the, the, regarding the monitoring uh, of compliance? Uh, one of the things that uh, was very important with uh, monitoring, well, let me just say this. Our office telephone number are on all the cable bills. So we're quite often contacted uh, first or at, 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 at a minimum second when there was any disconnection concerns uh, that would come up. Uh, but we have uh, worked with the cable company uh, and this is the perfect uh, public form, form to state this. Uh, January 20th is when uh, the payment was reactivated for the cable companies, but What's also in place is every single cable internet provider has agreed to offering a payment plan. Uh, Counselor, I don't think we have the specific rates uh, or, or numbers that were given to how many disconnections were in place. Um, but I will tell you that based on the climate of the pandemic, it was, it was not even an option to uh, conduct any disconnections at that time. Do you all deal with anything related to 5G? Counselor? Well, we don't regulate the cable provider's provision of internet service, but we help to facilitate it. They are okay. upgrading naturally to 5G and it's you know, to the benefit of residents that they have benefit to you know, take advantage of the most upgraded technology. I think part of the challenge from Chairperson White is that all of the cable providers are providing multiple services now. So they're not just providing internet, they're providing phone service. And so uh, because we have a good relationship with them, we can facilitate whatever's necessary for, on their side. And with respect, particularly with respect to residents, you know, and I think you heard this through the public witness. One of the things we're doing is expediting because no one likes to sit on uh, a customer service call for an hour, multiple times and get nowhere. And that's one of the things that we do. We expedite requests and we have a relationship with all of the providers and we can facilitate resolution if a resident reaches out to us. With respect to the disconnections, the cable providers had represented to us that they were not disconnecting any customers that called and requested a deferred payment plan. And we don't have information that indicates otherwise. 
Uh, we monitored them through, you know, when the uh, emergency legislation was initially introduced and passed. We immediately advised them. We had, you know, we have quarterly meetings with them, but we had daily exchange uh, regarding their compliance. And we maintained that posture until the effective date of the public health emergency related disconnection and deferred payment plan protections expire. Got it. I'm not sure if you can hear me. If you can hear me, clap twice. No. <laughs> You know, that used to be a commercial. Clap oh, yeah. on, clap off. Remember, I'm I'm a, I'm old school. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this: um, you 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 launched your the city's first uh, streaming network. Can you tell me some of the lessons learned? Or how was that experience? Because that's that's really big for the city. We are so excited! And shout out to the team. Um, one of the comments I was going to make uh, during uh, our general counsel's comment is we've made it a point, uh, thanks to the support of Mayor Bowser, thanks to the support of you, Chairperson White and the council, to be proactive more so than reactive. Uh, so one of the things that we felt uh, was needed, and we really noticed that heavily during this virtual climate, is to launch uh, an entertainment network uh, from a streaming perspective. So you can find us on Roku, uh, Amazon Fire, you can find us on Apple TV, uh, all the, the, the platforms. But what this has allowed us to do is engage not only with our local community, but engage with creatives nationally and, and quite frankly, globally. DC has such a diverse and vibrant creative community. Uh, and so we've built an entire platform showcasing the culture, you know, go-go and just the history uh, of our city. Uh, and so it's gone really well. Like there's a lot of content out there uh, virtually in general, but what we specialized in is content based on the District of Columbia, produced here in the District of Columbia, and it gives everyone a lens view on, a, on our city. So uh, right now we're focused on marketing the app um, and then creating more content. Uh, interesting enough, when the network launched, I can't tell you uh, the amount of calls that we got, uh, especially from other uh, large entities like Disney, um, Viacom and some of the other markets uh, just wanting to, to engage. But our focus is DC. Our focus is that creative content that you, you talked about earlier and the witnesses talked about earlier. We have a lot of filmmakers here uh, and we talk about beauty industry, cosmetology, uh, just culinary arts across the board through this DCE network. Thank you. And I'm, I guess I'm excited to hear that other people are also interested in what we're doing here in the city. They are. Um, I think they're, I think they're extremely shocked um, uh, of what, what we're doing. Uh, you, you mentioned podcast earlier uh, by launching DC radio a few years ago. Uh, this was another proactive approach versus reactive approach to be ahead of the game because there's, you know, of course people are still tuned in to your commercial radio, um, but it's amazing how many uh, people are, are tuned in to the various podcasts. Um, and we can only do that that uh, with the support of the council and the mayor and, and the team here at OCTF and me. Thank you. I know you talked about the virtual spelling bee. Mm -hmm. how, how many students participated in that? Can you explain like how you all coordinated with these young scholars to this amazing spelling bee? Well, we were able to partner with uh, Ms. Denise Rolark Barnes. So shout out uh, to the Washington Informer. We were able to partner uh, with her on this project. And the one benefit 
that we had as our media resource platform. Uh, instead of the spelling bee not taking place, we were able to take it virtually. So it was about 35 students that were that were here for the for the program. Um, and the students were represented from Ward 1, 3, 4, 6, and 8. So those were students from the various wards uh, that participated on stage for the for the spelling bee. Uh, and it, it's a great show. And we were able to uh, air that on DKN, the District Knowledge Network, uh, which is our educational channel. Great, I think that's remarkable. Um, and I'm, I'm a big supporter of putting positive content into media. Mm -hmm. I, there were there were a few words I, I was having trouble spelling so I was like I need to step my game up yeah <laughs> we appreciate that uh, just a partnership I also want to thank uh Mr. Wheaton, Denise Rolock Bonds as well yeah. for um since the since the writing that we had um through their through their advocacy with the Washington Formal also with the United Black Fund yeah um, over the, um I heard you talk about the, the, there were some, uh, the prices were lower as relates to fees. Uh, can you explain your, your theory around that and what does lower mean to a person trying to get some, some filming done? Uh, so for the fees, uh, that was related to the, the permits. So for example, when we talked about the student uh, fees, uh, they're just, they're non-existent, they're waived. Um, and then how we base the size of production companies, uh, we typically ask how many people are, are, are in your crew. And so it uh, may go from one to 30. Then there are some crews that come in like when Wonder Woman was here that could be, you know, a hundred plus. And of course, with those larger budgets, they're, high, they're charged higher Per permit fees. Uh, our focus to all is to always meet the person, organization, or business where they're at uh, to be able to tr to try to accommodate and make it a point to accommodate film productions of all sizes. Got it. Um, in your in your testimony, I think you mentioned there were one hundred and seventy five. Mm -hmm under the film rebate program correct correct what type of films were, were, were these what type of films uh, what do they do oh a little bit of everything so um in that that was part of our six uh awardees with the film rebate fund uh two of which the production companies were here local it can range uh, from everything from location scouting. When we were talking about locations earlier, uh, we have location scouts that go and identify locations uh, and they really focus on locations that's within the control of the city. Uh, and then of course, if there's a specific federal request that comes into play, but you have everything from production assistants to grips, camera operators, uh, directors, uh, we have it, people involved on the music side of things. That's always a beautiful thing when you can get uh, our musical scores done with Go Go or you know music that's specifically driven to DC. But it it uh, they have what's called above the line, which are your executive producers uh, that are engaged to your your PAs and your in your grips carrying the lighting equipment and holding the mics. So everything. Now, is this the same as the um, media training opportunities? No, that's different. So uh, the Creative Economy Career Access Program, CCAP, that's focused more on a six week or so training with DCTV. And then that particular training is where you get on the job paid training for, for one year. Uh, and that's primarily uh, driven with working with creative economy partners here locally in, in DC, uh, where they're working with uh, DC often businesses quite often. Uh, and they're geared toward everything from marketing, producing, uh, script writing, anything in the creative field. In addition to that, we've done some virtual 
trainings, like through our business over brand programming and through our 202 Creates uh, residency program and master classes, where we help uh, entities and businesses get all key startup information. And that's training that we offer uh, in general. There may be some legal advice needed uh, and we provide that information. Uh, from a training perspective, we are also engaged with the Marion Berry uh, Summer Youth Employment Program each year as well. What, 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 what about the Arts and Humanities Commission? Mm -hmm. Are you all in, in conjunction with them in the, in the sphere of entertainment and arts? So we, I, I speak with the director there quite often uh, and we are engaged. Uh, we really, we bounce ideas off of each other. And that's the beauty part about uh, with the Creative Affairs Office, OCTFME and the Commission on Arts and the Humanities is working together. Um, the Commission on Arts and Humanities, they focus uh, more on nonprofits uh, and then they also are grant making entity. Uh, we step in and bridge the gap and focus on for-profits as well as some nonprofit. Uh, we focus on entrepreneurs. So we, we serve as a, a, as a good complement to each other. CAH would be considered the, the state's arts agency because DC will be the 51st state. <laughs> so uh, CAH serves as the arts, uh, state arts agency. Uh, and then we uh, focus a lot on uh, sponsorships more so than grants uh, and do a lot of things related to startup. Music is uh, our sole focus here at the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment. We have, we have an important focus on music. So I'm often hearing about 202 Creates Mm -hmm. all over the place right <laughs> yeah can you tell us a little about what that is and what's the function of it and how the residents get involved with that we have ideas businesses in right. dc yes that's uh that's a great question they definitely can reach out uh to our office and actually there's a 202 creates uh dot com website where you can stay up up to date with everything that's happening through 202 creates uh you can also contact uh, our office directly, uh, visit entertainment.dc.gov. Uh, uh, there's a whole section dedicated to 202 Creates. Every September, we have 202 Creates Month. Uh, so we spend the entire month focused on all things creative. And basically 202 Creates highlights every creative business acumen that's happening in the 202. And that was a, a way to amplify and elevate uh, the talent here in Washington, DC. Uh, a couple of programs within that 202 Creates umbrella is the residency program. We launched uh, master classes. Uh, so each month there's a master class that'll come out with experts in the creative industry uh, that really will school and give advice uh, to individuals, not only that have started their careers uh, in creatives, but just uh, upstart information as well. But it touches ev everything, dance, theater, visual arts, just across the board. And it's our way. It's funny, someone reached out to me from Baltimore and was like, hey, can we, you know, do 202 creates here in Baltimore. I'm like, well, you know, we got to give the shine to, <laughs> to our creatives. Uh, but uh, for us, it's, it's all things creative here, here in the 202. Got it. Thank you for that. And we uh, appreciate you um, elevating those businesses in the community through this, through this vehicle. Um, this is going to be related to the budget. And programming, I guess. Okay. So, next few questions. In FY21, um, there was a $529,000 increase mm -hmm. from the budget to the revised budget for personnel services and the special purpose revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate on what contributed to these increases? Uh, the majority of it had to do with COLA. Uh, in step increases. Uh, I will uh, have Dr. Johnson uh, chime in with any additional feedback that you would like to give there. Thank you, Director Gates. Um, uh, good afternoon, Ch um, Chairman White. Um, thank you for your question. In regards to the increase in FY21, that estimated 
529,000, as Director Gates stated, it was due to the cost of living increase, COLA, uh, as, well as, as well as it was to support um, additional positions in the Creative Affairs Office. And are those positions filled? Yes, and I wanted to mention that those positions are filled and that for um, in FY22, those positions are fully funded. Okay, great. Um, so you do, so do you, uh, uh, don't you anticipate uh, the same thing happening again? Tell me, because we want to be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Sure, no, thank you. I um, mean, FY21, um, there was an, an adjustment to offset those additional costs that were incurred in personnel services and our special purpose revenue, SPR. Uh, however, uh, we made the proper adjustments just to ensure um, in FY22 and moving forward in the formulation of the budget that those positions are fully funded so that there wouldn't be any additional costs that we incur. Got it. Um, and this is that there was a, the agency was able to absorb roughly 1.1 million for non-personnel services. Can you elaborate on uh, what the agency was able to do to achieve this type of reduction? And do you anticipate the same thing happening again? Thank you for that question. One of the things that we, uh, like many of the agencies across uh, the District of Columbia government is with the COVID pandemic, uh, we had to make some significant uh, adjustments. Uh, Dr. Johnson can go into the specifics, uh, but the majority of it was tied to uh, making those reductions uh, due to offset uh, some of the losses that we've experienced uh, due to the pandemic. Dr. Johnson, would you like to elaborate on some specifics? Sure, thank you, Director Gates. Uh, Council Member uh, Chairman uh, White, as Director Gates stated, um, in FY21, we faced some unique um, situations in regards to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, yielded a, um, an opportunity, if, if you will, to make sure that we were able to uh, take expenditures that we normally incur in regards to administrative and operational expenditures um, in FY21. Um, and we were able to um, um, actually make adjustments with our, within our FY21 budget. Um, in regards to FY22, uh, we do not anticipate um, the same level of those administrative and operational um, expenditures because now we're getting back to sense of normalcy in regards to um, the capacity and the density low within our facilities, um, in regards to fixed costs and other related costs um, as we get back to providing a normal um, delivery services within the OCT FME agency. Chairperson, uh, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking away. Um, <laughs> can you elaborate on additional gross pay? Uh, for FY22 of 58361 dollars as an allocation in FY21. Uh, I think that was $29,078 for personnel services, um, specifically for the special purpose revenue. Uh, thank you for that question. I believe the fifty-eight thousand uh, dollars that you were referring to, uh, there was an annual leave payout of approximately thirty-three thousand uh, dollars, and then in addition to that, there was a retirement incentive for twenty-five thousand dollars, and so that brings us to that fifty-eight thousand dollars that you are inquiring about. Okay, any reference to the 29,000 for personnel services? Was that included for special purpose revenue? That was another annual uh, leave payout uh, for staff that transitioned from government. The, the additional 29K. Okay. Um, in the agency's response to the committee, it was mentioned uh, that the the district is a participant in a coalition of local governments and local government organizations nationwide. Uh, can you give me more information on what, what our role is with that? 
Uh, I'll uh, begin the discussion. Um, what we have found in general, uh, Council Cooper, uh, I'll have you chime in here as well. Uh, it, we found as, a, as opposed to working in silos uh, as cable regulators, uh, it has been uh, very beneficial to come together because we definitely have a lot of commonality of things we want to accomplish, uh, especially as government um, when it comes to in-kind services and things that we receive from from the cable company. Our general counsel, Lawrence Cooper, uh, works very closely uh, with the coalition. So, Counselor, if you'll elaborate. Uh, certainly, uh, Chairperson White. In 2019, the FCC uh, issued an order that had major impact on local franchising authorities. And to cut to the chase, they're trying to limit the authority that local franchise authorities have over their own rights of way, because that's really what a franchise is. You're giving them permission to build out into public land, you know, their infrastructure to provide cable services and now uh, internet services. Um, there were two or three issues that with this particular order 621 that impact most jurisdictions uh, for the district, the courtesy cable services that are provided to the government, the cost of those, as well as the cost of, to the extent you could come up with one, the actual um, broadcast space, so to speak, that the district is given for its channels, DCN, DCC and DKN. Uh, this order would basically give the providers the ability to offset that against the franchise fees they paid, the 5% fee and the 2% PEG fees or what have you, uh, as well as some other language sort of limiting what jurisdictions could do. Uh, a lot of uh, the jurisdictions in this area around the metropolitan area, uh, as well as other uh, larger urban areas sort of came together and secured counsel to pursue challenging the FCC's decision in the courts. In the Sixth Circuit and ultimately uh, up to the Supreme Court, uh, unfortunately, the petition for cert was denied on yesterday. So uh, the coalition is now shifting back to the FCC. And as you know, uh, there's sort of been a change in the balance of power. So the hope is that pushing for reconsideration uh, with a, a commission that might be more friendly to local government interests. I hope that was sufficient for you. Yeah, that was definitely a timely update too. So it was definitely sufficient and efficient. Um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, I go on, I'm in the community often uh, interacting with uh, stakeholders about participating in DC council hearings, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, we're in virtual right now and uh, we've gone from uh, in-person to now virtual, uh, et cetera. Uh, I guess what I'm, some of the feedback I get is that you know most of the hearings are taking place in the daytime while I'm at work, mm -hmm. and so that's an advantage for the working class. And to my knowledge, that we are unable to do hearings with OCT FME uh, after six. Um, how what, what's some of the restrictions with that, and how can we adjust this to ensure that we are indeed creating a vehicle for everyday residents, especially the working class, to chime in and give uh, advocacy or a valued opinion to how we run our, our government in District of Columbia? That's a great question. Uh, and I'll provide you uh, a couple of steps that we can take. Uh, what we often do, particularly uh, as relates to DCC, we uh, serve as the platform uh, to, to host those, those hearings. Um, we also put them on our website. Um, but we obtain uh, the directive and the, the instruction from the secretary of the council. So each week we'll get a schedule. And especially uh, with things having been virtual, we'll get a schedule of what we can put up 
live uh, from the secretary's office uh, of the council. And then whatever is recorded, we end up uh, putting that up on the, on the websites. Now, uh, we just as recently as last week, we have advanced a step further where uh, different council members have been at the chambers and we've, been, we've done what was a hybrid, a combination of in-person by utilizing our infrastructure uh, at the Wilson Building at the same time simultaneously with Zoom. So that's an additional step. Uh, what I also would like to add uh, when we discuss time, now that we have the ability uh, to be um, more in person and more on site uh, as the pandemic is uh, lowering, uh, because we did have to make a transition in the beginning with the number of staff that we would have on, on site. But we are prepared and we're in a position uh, that we can uh, have hearings beyond six o'clock. To your point, there are a lot of people that are working, but we will continue to stand on our mission and platform to be an open and transparent government and agency. And in order to do that, accessibility is, is key. So we are prepared and we're ready uh, to, to do hearings beyond the six o'clock timeframe. We'll work with the secretary's uh, office at the council. Uh, I remember uh, prior to the pandemic, there were, I think it was the comp plan or one of the other hearings went until one or two o'clock in the morning uh, and the team was, was available and, and, and ready. So we're prepared uh, to move in that direction. Thank you. You have a remarkable team that's been dedicated from what I know over the years I've been in uh, public service. So I want to thank you and your team. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I, you spoke about some of these briefly in your opening statement, but we wanted to hear about the progress of your FY22 top priorities, like uh, Launch Go Go People's Plan, the mm -hmm. Community Violence Prevention Programming and Public Service and Announcement Series. Uh, marketing promoted District of Columbia Entertainment Network mobile and digital platform applications. If you can speak a little about that, that'd be helpful to us. So a couple of things, uh, the launch uh, community violence uh, prevention programming campaign, that's what we're doing uh, in, in house. So we are creating content here at the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment. Uh, we're doing a combination of things. We're creating uh, PSAs um, regarding uh, unresolved homicides. We're also talking about uh, wraparound services that are available throughout the district uh, government. So these are PSAs, public service announcements, as well as interstitials that we are creating in-house. So we've started developing those uh, as well. We are working with uh, Duke Ellington, uh, School of the Arts on a go-go initiative. And it's similar to uh, uh, artists in residency program where we are working on, instead of your uh, teacher that you may uh, typically work with in the classroom, uh, we will be working with GoGo -Go artists to serve as the instructors to teach students about the culture of GoGo -Go, uh, because they have lived it uh, for many, many years. Uh, what we also have discussed uh, with Duke Ellington in particularly is not limiting it to their site, is taking some of these initiatives, programs, and bringing them across uh, all eight wards. I know the uh, principal uh, at Duke Ellington is gonna be reaching out to uh, the principal at Baloo and, and probably ha has already done so. Uh, but we thought that it was important to make sure that it wasn't limited to just that uh, physical building. Uh, so we're well on our way there. Uh, one of the last things is marketing the uh, platform for DCE. Uh, since we recently launched uh, the network in 2021, it's important that we just uh, continue to make the audience not only locally, but regionally, nationally aware of this platform uh, and really you know, stake our claim as being the go-to network uh, for all things uh, district related. And so uh, things are going really well with all three uh, initiatives for FY 2022. Uh, and by the time we reach the fourth quarter, we will have uh, reached all of these goals. 
and they, and they will be at 100% completion. Great, great. Um, there was some legislative legislation submitted, um, new legislation that was to support the economy recovery of the District of Columbia, um, specifically focus on, I guess, tax breaks and rebates mm -hmm. um, for, the, I guess, the creative economy. Can you speak on what's the vision for that? Right. Uh, thank you for that question. I now have our general counsel uh, provide some additional comments as well. But our legal and regulatory team uh, worked very hard along with the Creative Affairs Office uh, to uh, solidify our PAPA Amendment Act for 2021, which is geared to live uh, entertainment venues uh, of a capacity of 300 uh, or less uh, that does about a minimum of 48 hours of programming. Uh, this rebate is more property tax uh, related, uh, which was important, especially during the, the public health emergencies. Uh, Councilor Cooper, would you like to add? Uh, yes, Director Bates. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson White, for your, your question. So there was legislation, it's called a Performing Arts Promotion Amendment Act that allowed small performing arts venues to take advantage of a real property tax rebate. With the pandemic coming when there was a requirement that they had to have 48 hours of live performances every month. Of course, they couldn't do that if they were shut down with the public health emergency. We initially, uh, uh, with the support of the mayor and the council, we were able to uh, cover the prior fiscal year, but no one anticipated the pandemic going into another fiscal year. So the uh, modification that was made for FY21 allows the 48 hour performance requirement to basically be uh, suspended during any months of a public health emergency within a fiscal year. And so that enabled a, a number of these smaller venues to be able to take advantage of this, you know, for a small venue, large real property tax rebate. Got it, got it. I do want to thank you, you and your team, Director, for uh, res responding to our questions prior to the hearing um, so we can share and look through with our other committee members and staff. Uh, this is very helpful for us. Um, and in conclusion, um, I want to thank you today for uh, your, your coming and listening to the public witnesses and also speaking today to the public about the mission and vision of what the agency is doing, right? And I think that's very important to communicate, but also get feedback of how to improve uh, this office um, to better serve the residents in the District of Columbia. Um, on a final note, this agency performance oversight hearing, if anyone could not testify, but would like to submit a written testimony, testimony to be included in an official record, you can email your testimony to the Committee on Recreation Library Youth Affairs at RYA at dccouncil.us. The official record will close Friday, February the 25th um, at 5.30 p.m. This agency oversight hearing is concluded with no other business before the committee. The time is now 1.47 p.m. This roundtable is adjourned. Thank you to all your witnesses and those who testified. Have a blessed day. <laughs>